Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. So, welcome to this week's episode of The Examined Life with Phil. That's me, and uh, here we just try and use philosophy to examine our lives. And this week we got a bit of a change of pace, as uh, Tim Carter is with me. He got a master's degree from Columbia Evangelical Seminary, and he's an executive pastor at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Sedalia, Missouri, and he's the co-founder of the Kylopolis Institute. Uh, How are you doing this evening, Tim? Doing well, doing well. Glad to be on the show. Thank you. I'm I'm very glad to have you. So, Tim, after I uh, aired my podcast on The Problem of Evil, I did a couple weeks, about a month ago now, Tim and I were discussing that a little bit on Facebook and eventually he kind of said, well, hey, why don't I come on your podcast to talk about this some more? And I thought, well, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm sure it'd be nice for people who listen to hear a voice other than mine for a change. So, yeah, so we're having Tim on this week. And uh, uh, just to uh, kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, so what I guess we'll jump right in. What thoughts did you have on the podcast I did, uh, Tim? Well, I think, you know, when when we're addressing the problem of evil, you know, it's obviously a topic that's always thrown out, especially when we're arguing for the existence of God. I know atheists like to go to, you know, well, if good God exists, then why is there evil in the world? And if God's all powerful, mm-hmm. then, you know, why, why do the bad things happen to good people? And, you know, you know, the, the same old lines we hear all the time. And I thought, uh, you know, addressing this issue is, is something that we need to kind of think through and, and be able to discuss with those around us. Um, and be able to give a, a good answer uh, to those who ask. And uh, so I listened to your podcast and uh, had some things that I agreed with and some things that I kind of scratched my head and thought, well, I don't know if I agree with that or not, but <laughs> I, uh, that's, why, that's why I'm here. I guess we'll uh, kind of discuss that and, and uh, see mm-hmm. if we can kind of uh, work things out. Sometimes, you know, uh, through discussion like this, we can find out that we're actually trying to say the same thing. We just say it differently at times. Oh yes, um, so, yes. Mm-hmm. And some sometimes we uh, we define our terms and we realize, hey, we are saying different things, and it gives us more to ponder and, and try to work through and understand. So I've been uh, been looking forward to this conversation. Um, one thing I did uh, like about uh, your presentation is uh, you you took some time to talk about the why and the how mm-hmm. of of the problem of evil and how we. Uh, why why it's a problem and, and how how it's addressed and could you maybe maybe rehash some of that oh um, yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's that's a very good idea and um i'd encourage people who are listening if you haven't heard that episode go back and listen to it because i'm sure it'll make listening to me and tim talk here a whole lot easier so the how why distinction that i talked about there is um When you think about this just in the regular world, there's a distinction between how things happen and why they happen. And what I mean by that is what's the purpose? And so the example that I like to give is let's suppose we're talking about uh, me reaching for a cup of coffee. Well, you can talk about the how processes in my arm, which are the muscles moving from electrical signals from my brain, the even the chemical processes in the cells and you could even go down to like the atoms of those chemicals and that's all how it's all physical process but the why is well i wanted to drink a cup of coffee it's the purpose and what i've observed about not all but many uh theodicies and attempts to explain the problem of evil uh, like uh i referenced it in the podcast Plantinga's very good free will defense is that those tend to be how answers which is they're trying to explain well, this is the way God set up the world. You have free will, therefore the the chance of evil follows. There, You can't give people free will without the possibility that we'll do the wrong thing, otherwise it's not free will. And that's not, that's a how explanation. That's not really a, something that it will explain why um, we, some people on uh, my wife's side of the family, they have a little da- daughter who's not even a year old who's suffering from a form of cancer. Well, the free will defense doesn't explain why that poor little girl has cancer. It's a horrible, horrible thing. And if we wanted to know why, what we'd want to know is not 
well, the physical laws in the universe have to be consistent, therefore cancer would arise. No, what we want to know is why does this specific little girl have cancer? Where's the good in that? We want to know the purpose or the teleology of it, not the how process. And at the same time, it's not that knowing how processes is necessarily bad. That's how we do a lot of science. That's what enables us to end a lot of suffering through vaccines and medical treatments. That's if we didn't learn about how processes, Tim and I wouldn't be, you and I wouldn't be able to talk right now because we're talking over computers, over the internet that were developed because people stopped and thought about the how questions of how the world works. But the why is more of the purpose. Um, I think that's more or less what I said in the podcast. Is that tracking with what you remember? Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty close on. So when we talk about the problem of evil, um, you know, maybe like you said, sometimes people go to the how. Mm-hmm. How how does this happen? And, and your answer to the how it happens is the typical free will answer. Well, free will. God has to allow free will, and because of free will, it provides the possibility for man to choose uh, to do evil. Is that correct? I would say that answers a lot of it, probably not all. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm i pretty suspicious of anybody who claims they have a theodicy that answers everything, that's just going to explain it all. Um I think you can probably get as close as, like, say, answering maybe 90% of the instances of evil with something like a free will defense. But I'm pretty sure somebody could come up with an example where I'm like, well, it's really kind of hard to see how God giving us free will in any way addresses that. Uh, But the reason I say it's excellent is I think if you can get a answer that's right to something as difficult as the problem of evil that works 90% of the time, hey, that's fantastic. (laughs) That's right. You know, so, yeah, so, so I would say probably the most, the majority of the time that works, but I'm, I don't think it works all the time. Okay. So let's, let's step back from the question here. Um, what's, uh, what's the typical scenario that we see this problem arise in? You mean when people are asking about it? or Yeah, when people bring up the problem of evil, what's the typical scenario? Oh, um, as best as I can tell, it's usually in the context of, well, this suffering happened to me, it was unjust, therefore how could God allow this? And that varies from everything from things that I would say are uh, legitimate, really heartfelt, like that little girl who has uh, cancer, or when I gave the example in the podcast— there was a f- friend from college whose two-year-old little girl had died, and things like that. I I get that. That's that. Um, if you're gonna shake your fist at the sky and scream "Why God?" over something like that, I'm not gonna say that it's the right thing to do, but I understand. I I can totally see how you would get do that. And so, but then there's also people who would be like, well. I didn't get into the college I wanted to when I applied. Therefore, I'm suffering unjustly. Therefore, there's something wrong with God. And I'm much less sympathetic to people who make claims like that. So, right. Yeah. Right. And so that's typically how I found it. Um, sometimes, very, maybe it's because I go to philosophical conferences, but I've occasionally had people bring it up to me in the abstract philosophical sense. But I don't think that's typical of how most people uh, deal with it. So, right. Right. So as as believers, you know, kind of uh, approaching it from, you know, the typical layperson, um, why why is it important that we uh, be able to address the problem of evil? Or or let's well, maybe frame it this way. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> it happens to me. Don't don't worry about it. So. So, so why, uh, you know, when when we address this problem, um, how should we go about addressing it? As a, as a lay person, uh, someone in the church, uh, somebody brings up this problem. Let's let's say it's a legitimate, you know, you. And when I say legitimate, I have to be, you know, define my terms here. Mm-hmm. Um, something non uh, petty, like I didn't get in the school I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. legitimate pain and suffering in life that people incur. Tragedy mm-hmm. that happens, uh, 
they say, well, you know, how could God allow this to happen? Uh, you know, if God is good, why, why do bad things happen? You know, the why, mm -hmm. um, what's the best way in, in your mind, how we answer that? Uh, well, I'll back up a little bit and say that typically what I found in reading the philosophical literature on this, uh, that usually what the philosophers try and do is make a distinction between what they call the logical problem of evil and the emotional problem of evil. Mm -hmm. Um, and what they mean by that is the logical problem of evil is they're just answering, they're answering in the philosophical, the abstract sense. That's what the Planicus free will defense is. It's saying, well, there's no... Uh, there's no apparent, no prima facie contradiction between God existing and evil existing. Therefore, you're unjustified in claiming this evil happened to me. Therefore, God doesn't exist. Um, and I would say that's legitimate in like an academic sense. It's legitimate in the sense that if somebody's, uh, ha they have that roadblock in their mind that's keeping them from coming to Christ, then you can talk about that and remove that. Uh, like if that's the thing that somebody's saying, well, I can't believe in God, I can't believe in Christ because of this, and then you present them the free will defense or another theodicy that works, well, that's legitimate and good. But at the same time, I would say probably most people, that's not what they're looking for, and it's not going to help them. And that's where I'm a little skeptical of the philosophers who make this distinction, because I'm like, well, you kind of just pushed all the hard part, all the nitty gritty, all the practical part over to the emotional part, and then just moved on from that. You just left it aside. And I'm not, I've uh, written to a couple of philosophers who've uh, made that distinction and kind of asked them, why do you make this distinction? Why don't you go back and then deal with the emotional aspect? And so far, I've never got an answer back. So maybe one day I will. Um, but practically speaking, that's, that's difficult because um, hmm. I've actually got a, uh, interview I've lined up to do next week with a guy who wrote a paper on this. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to him because he suggested that part of what's going on with people who are undergoing, you know, this extreme pain and suffering that's legitimate is they're undergoing a type of trauma that in some sense present prevents them from behaving rationally. And if he's right about that, and I think he might be then it's not going to work for me to say to them, well, you're not justified in thinking this way because I can give you this good argument. Even if I'm right, that doesn't do them any good because if you, they're not capable of following me because of what's going on in their lives. So practically speaking, I think uh, probably what the best thing to do for someone who's suffering through all that from what I've read and what I've seen is just be there with them and love them and be as Christ to them through their pain and suffering until hopefully they get to the point where you can discuss these things rationally with them again. Um, uh, that's, I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent there. Uh, what do you think? No, I think, you know, when, when dealing with the problem, a lot of the times the, the people that are really dealing with struggles and pain in their life, um, you know, it's not the logical arguments that like, we go to, to, you know, you don't, you don't sit down and lay out your concise argument and, you know, I know your family member just died, but let me lay this out for you and explain why. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that would be kind of heartless. Um, so, you know, when we address people, you know, we, we got to know where they're at and, uh, and know, uh, how, how to talk with them. But, you know, I think the end goal, at least in my mind is, is when we address the problem of evil, you know, ultimately, um, while there is a problem, we have a solution uh, to the problem of evil uh, in Christ. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of times um, uh, we, we spend a lot of time formalizing these arguments uh, mm -hmm. to address the problem, but we never throw out a solution sometimes. Um, and, you know, and that's not saying that the, that the, that the formation of the argument of, of answering the problem of evil is is meaningless and that it doesn't have value in, in our conversations with others, but it's a piece of the puzzle of the whole um, leading to Christ. Um, but that goes back to, you know, the problem itself, you know, why is it a problem? You know, so 
when we're when we're going to address the problem of evil, you know, people people bring this up. Um, you know, well, if God is good, then why did He allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. um, but from there, you have to define, okay, well, what is good? <laughs> okay, yeah. And and I mean, I mean, you you really have to get into it because if we're really going to understand and, and break it down, at least in my mind, you know, if if we're going to throw a standard out there, we, we have to be on the same page of what that standard is, because mm -hmm. if, if it's subjective. Then it's then it's emotional, and it's different for different people. And evil, mm -hmm. um, and suffering is not evil and suffering for another individual as it is for the individual down the street. So, without the standard, uh, it's hard to measure the problem as a whole. I would say. Yeah, so, yeah, I I would absolutely agree with you there. That's some. Um, I didn't put this in the podcast, but the. Uh, I've got a document I've been working on the problem of evil for like five, six years, and I based a lot of the stuff on the podcast from that. And in that, I have an example of where um, the, I think part of the reason why why questions are difficult is what's very bad for one person might be very good for another. Um, a easy example is, let's say uh, my wife and I are going broke, and I have to sell all my great books that I love so much off at low prices to help pay our mortgage. Well, that's very bad for me, but it's very good for the people who suddenly got a good deal on a bunch of books that I I think it, at least are pretty great. And, you know, that's kind of a little bit of a frivolous example, but we can apply that same thing out to great, you know, things that are bad and horrific. When a soldier jumps on an IED to save his friends, well, that's in many senses pretty bad for him. He's going to die or be horribly maimed. But it's a very good thing for his friends. So that's like what you're saying there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you got into it a little bit in your podcast uh, talking about um, Joseph uh, and his brothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, that story. And, you know, and, and, uh, and when we look at Christ on the cross, you know, the, the, the most evil thing that could happen, the, the killing of the only innocent person on earth mm -hmm. on the cross— who was God in the flesh, you know, that was the, the worst evil that could be committed, but yet it was used for great good. Mm -hmm. um, and so where we kind of got, where you kind of got a little, uh, I, I was with you uh, in your in your discussion on, on the problem of evil until we kind of got into that, that point, and I, I agree up to that point, Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we got to look to the purpose of you know of why things happen in order to address the problem of evil and understand it um, mm -hmm. and how we how we solve that problem. Um, you know, th there are multiple levels to it. Um, obviously, as as a believer, uh, follower of Christ, um, we are committed to being like Christ and loving justice and mercy and and seeking those things for those around us and serving those around us and showing love uh and trying to thwart the evil around us um but yet uh, we live in a sinful fallen world where evil continues to exist um so you know that's one level where we can try to deal with it but on a on a grander scale when we're going to address this problem i think a lot of times we got to understand kind of the hierarchy in place of, of where we fit into the picture uh, to help us understand uh, how we deal with um, this problem of evil. Um, mm -hmm. So looking at Joseph and his brothers, you know, I think that's a good example that you brought up is, you know, Joseph's brothers intended something for his harm, but God intended it for his good. Yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so God obviously had a purpose in what Joseph's brothers were doing uh, that served a greater, a greater good. Um, and as we go through biblical history in the Old Testament, we, we actually do see that. You know, we see God's hand every mm -hmm. step of the way. Even when things are meant for evil, they bring about God's purpose and plan, and they, they bring about a good with them. Um, and uh, do you want to maybe kind of share what you said about that? Um, yeah, yeah. I would say um, 
at the very least, uh, they can do that. And um, I, the exa- I use the story of Joseph just because it's so poignant in that, in that um, the bi- scripture there literally tells us exactly what the purpose of Joseph's suffering was when Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You sold me into slavery. You tried to kill me. And yet God used this great evil that you did to me to prepare the way so our families could come here and not starve in this horrible famine. And not only Joseph's and his brothers and their families, but thousands, possibly even millions of other people, depending on what the population of Egypt was then, you know. So that's a, just such a clear example of such a good such a good coming from something that's evil. And uh, the, I guess the, I don't, I wouldn't want to use the word paradox, but the complexity in that is, what happened to Joseph was still evil, even though God used it for such a great good. But I would say there, it seems to me that the God, the good God did, is probably greater enough that it could justify uh, the evil that was done to Joseph, even though it was still evil. And uh, the reason I go right to the example of Christ's uh, death on the cross is because that's just such a great example of that, where I, I'm i pretty firmly convinced that uh, grace is the greatest thing that exists in this world, and we only got that through the death of Christ, which is, you know, as you said, almost certainly the worst evil that ever happened in this world. So, so when we look at Mm-hmm. Um, when we look at these instances, um, how do we how do we communicate that? So, like somebody's going through, um, maybe Excuse went me. through a, a time of suffering, and we and we can look to Joseph and say, you know, well, you know, we see that God works uh, in our lives uh, to bring about the good of those for those who love Him, as we see in Romans, um, and we see that carried out in Joseph's life. Um, how does that how does that fit within our answer to the problem of evil? Uh, do you mean philosophically and abstractly, or practically? Practically, like I'm talking to someone who's let's let's two year old daughter died, and I need to try to help them. Right. Let's start philosophically and abstractly, and then we'll work our way down. Okay. Um, so God. God intended what happened to Joseph for good. Joseph's brothers intended it for evil. Um, hmm. Well, I would say the typically the uh, objection or uh, in the I'm losing my thoughts here. Sorry. In the logical problem of evil, typically the objection is now formed as there's gratuitous evil. There's evil that's unjustified couldn't be justified or is very unlikely to be justified uh, in uh, academic philosophy and philosophy of religion with a few minor exceptions. Pretty much everybody agrees uh, planning is free will defense just totally destroyed the logical problem of evil. So now most of the discussion is, well, it's not that God and evil are totally incompatible. It's that there's too much suffering. There's too much evil. There's too much examples of things that are at least possibly gratuitous that can't be justified. So you might kind of phrase it as, well, if there were 50% less wars instead of the amount that there are, then maybe we could say there's not a problem. Of course, it doesn't actually work that way, but that's just an example of the kind of argument they're trying to make. And so when you start appealing to examples of Joseph and his brothers or uh, Christ, I think what that demonstrates to us is that, well, no, it's actually very, very unlikely that there is any uh, gratuitous evil. It's very unlikely that there is any evil that can't be justified because you have the clear example of something that is the worst evil that could be done where humanity literally tried to kill God and we get the greatest thing ever from it, which is grace. And so if that's the case, that you can get such a extremely great good from such an extremely awful evil, then when you're talking about things that are obviously lesser, like tragedies in our own lives, this person dying from a car crash or something like that, then obviously it has to be the case that it's at least possible some real good can come from that. If the worst thing that ever happened can bring about the best thing that ever happened, uh, 
then things that are not as bad can obviously still bring about good. Yeah. Are you tracking with me there? Does that make yeah, sense yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, you know, I think you know, I think we're on the same page in a lot of things, um, and uh, I think it's just good to to hash out in more detail sometimes when we get into discussions like this uh, and listen to your podcast earlier, you know, it's good to hash out um, more of the practical side of things sometimes and uh, kind of see how that plays out in, in our lives and how, how we deal with it with those around us. And, you know, when you're yeah. dealing with, you know, the person that suffered the tragedy in their life, uh, you know, obviously this, the first thing you go to is not, okay, let's deal with the problem of evil. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the last thing on their mind right now. Uh, you know, it's, you're there to comfort them, to love on them, to show them the love of Christ, uh, you know, to point them to the truth, but in, in a way that's loving and consoling. And, you know, when the time is right, if that's even a problem with that person, then, you know, we need to be able to work through, you know, well, we don't always know why, but we do know the character and nature of God and know that he's in control and that he's able and does work out these things for our good, for the good of those who love him, as we see in Romans. Um, so, you know, we can look to God and his, his plan and his purpose um, and understand that while it appears that uh, sometimes we get these, this argument thrown out to us and it appears as though we don't have a good answer, but we really do have a good answer to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can point others to the gospel through that, I, I guess you could say. Um, so, on, uh, but, uh, but no, I think, you know, um, in, in dealing with the problem, uh, I think the issue, when it comes to the issue of free will, uh, and that's kind of where um, I maybe uh, took a different approach in, in, in answering you know, why does evil exist? Well, because God has to allow free will to exist. Um, would you say that God is limited or God cannot override man's will or can God override man's will? <laughs> <laughs> Open another well, can of worms you, here. You just asked a very, very. Uh, <laughs> so, OK, so let me so. let me put it let me put it into a, in, into some context. OK, so okay, with, with the problem of, with the problem of evil. uh Evil, would you say that evil occurs because God allows free will? Is that how? Or in, in some cases, I would say definitely yes. I wouldn't want to say a hundred percent of the time that's why, but at least some, at least some of the time, yes. So when, okay. Um, my wife gets upset with me because I very rarely commit myself to things a hundred percent of the time. So I hope I'm not frustrating <laughs> you too much. Oh no 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 no! It comes I'm with not... learning too much philosophy. Apparently, you so <laughs> second guess everything. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I get it. Um, so kind of going to uh, we shared some words on Facebook in mm -hmm. in the post. Mm -hmm. We were kind of talk back and forth there uh and that was I'll, I'll be honest that was before i listened to the podcast uh okay. I, saw your, I saw your post and uh you know we kind of got into the discussion of free will and and how people go to the the topic of free will as an answer to the problem of evil and essentially uh what i gathered from that um was that um kind of the go-to answer for a lot of people is well evil exists because of free will and God has to allow mm -hmm. free will, um, and since God has to allow free will, evil exists. Is that a correct formula? Yeah, I, that's a, a go-to answer on a popular level. It, there's a I alluded to Platonic's free will defense in the podcast, and he gets a much better, more sophisticated version of it. But that's a that's a basic summary. Yeah, um, and I again I'd say that's right probably most of the time. I'm I think there are some examples where you can't explain that you can't excuse me you can't explain that particular instance of evil and suffering by free will at least not easily but most of the time that just seems to be kind of apparent to me it's very obvious to me when i behave badly 
that's because I behave badly. It was my own will going wrong, and I can see multiple examples of that in other people's lives as they interact with me and each other. And each other. That's I, I, I don't want to use the word obvious too much, but that just seems pretty apparent. So, so in dealing with that, though, uh, doesn't it cause a problem if 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 ninety percent of it is caused by free will? Why is not all of it caused by free will? Wouldn't it follow that? If 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 it's either all or none. Well, <laughs> it might. Um, that's more me kind of hedging my philosophical bets. Where I've read enough of the literature, where I've found some clever philosophers positing an example where, well, in this case, isn't it kind of hard to explain how free will caused that? And I'm kind of I be like, well, okay, maybe. Um, because there's some a few particular counterexamples that are kind of hard to come back on and say, well, that's definitely caused by free will. If you extend it a lot and say, like, well, it's not caused by free will of necessarily humans, but it's caused by free will of, like, Satan and demons as well, then you start explaining it well. But I, uh, even though I certainly do believe in Satan and demons. I I don't really want to kind of push it that far unless I have to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, but in in that discussion though, we have to you know, you know, when we talk about free will, what are we talking about? Are we are we talking about a creaturely will, uh, or are we talking about a a will that is autonomous that man can 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 act uh, without cause? I think, um, well, I think using the term act without cause is a little bit, uh, I don't know, probably not intentionally, but kind of slightly misleading. Mm -hmm. I would say as a physical agent, when you act, you are the cause of that act. And then I would define free will just in a pretty classic libertarian sense, which is you did one thing and you had the ability to do at least one other. And in the real world, of course, you often have much more than two choices. You've got multiple ones, but you ate the cookie, but you could have decided not to. You, I sinned this way, but I could have decided not to. That, are you following me there? Right, but isn't the will what determines the decision? So that wouldn't the will you you have the decision before you to eat the cookie or not to eat the cookie? But your will is the determining factor of what determines that decision. So the will is governing the decision, right? Yeah, but in that sense, the I, the I that is Phil, and the will are maybe not identical, but pretty closely linked. At least that's how that's the position I take. And that's this is a bit of a controvert. Well, not a bit. It's an extremely it's controversial, extremely controversial topic. philosophically. <laughs> um, I know in academic philosophy, compatibilism and determinism are all the rage now, but I don't go that way. I think that's a uh, uh, problematic and self-refuting uh, in many senses. So, yeah. So it's still, of course, very controversial. Um, in that, in I would say, in one sense, you could say the will governs it, but in another sense, it is me doing it. It's sort of like you could say, well, in one sense, I obey the laws of America because the government passed them, but in another sense, I obey them because. I choose to. It, it, there's a. I think there's a different couple of senses going on there. Right, but it goes back to what's governing the choice, because if if something is determining that choice, then there's obviously a limitation to that choice. Correct. Oh yeah, of, of course there are. Um, well, obviously there are practical limi- limitations. Like right. I can't get, walk. I can't end talking to you, go outside and decide I'm going to go for a fly in the night sky without, you know, getting in an airplane or something like that. Um, So there are obviously practical limitations like that. And I would be willing to extend that to the case that even forming like habits in your life can kind of impose practical limitations like that. Like if you're... If you're someone who has, say, a tendency toward addiction, and rather than fighting that, you foster that in your life, 
then the next time somebody gives you a chance to do drugs or drink too much or something, well, it's far more likely you will rather than not because of those prior habits. Your practical limitations have it, we wouldn't tend to think of that in the same way as like me not being able to fly, but I would be willing to extend it that far as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, kind of circling back to, to, to the issue of free will and the existence of evil kind of pulling it kind of full circle. Um, you know, I, w I would say that we have a, a creaturely will that we can, we can live and operate at, in and act in, but that is ultimately, you know, connected to uh our nature um so man uh being born uh sinful by nature uh is going to sin and going to struggle with sin mm -hmm. um unless that nature is changed uh by by the gospel and the, and the power of christ um and, and that person becomes a new creation and their nature changes you know, obviously we struggle struggle with sin uh, mm -hmm. after coming to Christ, but we are, you know, on a path of sanctification and and becoming more like Christ. Um, but when it comes to the problem of evil, um, could we not say that evil exists because man is sinful by nature? Uh, well, uh, let's back up for a second. I, okay. I agreed with probably m almost all of what you say there, but wh how would you define creaturely freedom? What do you? What exactly do you mean by that? So ultimately, you know, we don't have. I, w I would disagree with libertarian free will. Mm -hmm. um, that we um, we we are able to we 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 have free will in the sense that we choose what we want to do. But it's limited in the sense that um, that choice wasn't made without um, something causing that choice to happen or something governing that choice, ultimately our nature, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, I, in general, I'd agree with that. I don't think anything can be contrary to its nature. It's why God can't – it's why it's ridiculous when somebody says – well, God isn't omnipotent because he can't sin. Well, sin is, by definition, what's contrary to God's nature. Um, that's a easy way to explain that. And so I couldn't do something that's contrary to my nature of being a human being. And uh, I've done a little bit of thinking about this, and I'm not quite sure if I'd go this far, but I might even be going willing to go as far as say, I have a nature that's not just being a human, but also one that's being a male and be, even one that's specifically being Phil that would be distinct from your nature, which is being Tim, even though we're both human males, there's something distinct about you and me. Right. Is that, is that tracking with what you're trying to say or? Yeah, kind of. I mean, like, like I said, it, it, it's a difficult, controversial subject to talk about. So you got to choose your words <laughs> wisely and make sure you mm -hmm. communicate, communicate as concisely as you can. Um, but when we look at the problem of evil, uh, obviously uh, evil exists because uh, man – evil is in the world because man sinned against mm -hmm. God. Um, and you know we can explain why there's evil in the world and why tragedy happens because of the curse of sin uh, on man uh, from the fall. Um, so when addressing the problem of evil um, – you know, I think we we have to take that into effect that you know evil exists, uh, and evil is in the world, and, and bad things happen in the world because sin is in the world, and, and man, in disobedience, brought sin into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, you know, then we begin to address the problem of evil. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, um, but see. That's that sounds a whole lot like the free will defense to me, what you just said, and obviously you're trying to push back against that. So can you elaborate right. a little bit? So, um, so you're saying the free will argument applies to Adam and not to us? Oh, I think it would apply to both. Uh, yeah, it, it, it clearly. I think it clearly ha has to apply to Adam, but I think it applies to me as well because. When I sin, although that tendency is definitely within my nature, but 
I could do otherwise. And part of the reason I think that is that um, if I couldn't have done otherwise, then I can't see how it would be just to hold me responsible for it. it there would be something wrong with God saying, well, you sinned, but there's no way you could have not. Therefore, you're responsible for it. It's kind of analogous to the person who uh, you're in a, well, you're in a crowded subway tunnel and somebody pushes you from behind. You bump into the person in front of you. They fall into the subway tracks and get run over by the subway and die. Well, did you commit murder? No, of course not. It, you weren't responsible. You were just pushed by somebody else and you just happened to be the person in the middle. You were the cog in the machine that was turning through no control of your own. And so if it's the case that I had to sin or necessarily had to sin because of my sinful nature, then it's kind of unjust that I would be held responsible for that. And since I'm, com for other reasons, I think I should be held responsible for my sin, then I kind of have to look back and say, well, I should have been able to do otherwise. Is that, are you following what I'm saying or? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm computing in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's no problem. These are you've uh, de definitely pushed to some very fundamental questions, which is good. That's what I'm glad I'm, ha I'm having you on the show. So, yeah. So, okay. You have to be res you have to be able to not sin in order to be responsible for your sin. Yeah, yeah. It, it, okay. That I, that seems to me to be the case. Otherwise, you're sort of not really different than a cog in a machine that's turning because another cog is uh making it turn you know right. the so the gun isn't responsible for the murder it commits because it can't do anything about it right so i would say is, they can i would say on a fundamental level um you know we are born sinners mm -hmm. uh, we, we're not sinners because we sin we sin because we're sinners if that makes sense, it's, it's our nature to sin and in mm -hmm. Adam. Um, so even, even if an individual were to be born and to, in all worldly standards, live a good and perfect life, they would still be sinful and sinful by nature um, before God. And um, so when we look at the issue of free will, I would argue that being able, yes, you could be able, how do I, how do I phrase it? Um, so by nature, we're sinful. And the argument you put forward is um, it wouldn't be just to punish man for sin if he wasn't freely able to not sin, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I guess you could, uh, another, if this helps, I could give you another example, which is, it's in my dog's nature to chase the cat. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's what dogs do. But at the same time, I, my wife and I have trained him. We haven't quite trained it out of him, but we've trained it to him to do it a lot less. Uh, and so even though that's in his nature, we sort of kind of hold him responsible by punishing him and encouraging him not to. And we've kind of trained him to do that less. Right. Okay. So Which to... presupposes he could not chase the cat, even though that's what his nature inclines him to do. Right. So is... So the, I guess the fundamental question really comes down to the punishment of sin. Um, is sin are, – are, do we deserve punishment merely by our sinful nature and being uh, in Adam and not in mm -hmm. Christ? Or is punishment only needed when action is committed? Ah, <laughs> now, now you've because just asked another very fundamental question. <laughs> I've got, so, I mean, we're, and, and that's the problem of of of, of the topic of, of mm -hmm. at hand is is, and that's part of the problem I have with the the answer of free will. 
uh, being kind of the go-to answer for the problem of evil is it's not that simple um, because just because sorry I had a message pop up on my computer <laughs> oh it happens um, well I guess the whole I guess the hold up for me is um, I don't feel like the free will and, and, and you kind of hit it at too uh, you, you you said you know ninety percent of of it we you know maybe attribute to free will, but there's a portion that we can't uh, of of why evil exists. And I, I would go more towards you know there's evil in the world because of the fall, uh, mm-hmm. because of man's disobedience to God, and, and and that brought with it a curse. And mm-hmm. you know, in, in reality, the question the, the proper question is why is there good in the world? Uh, <laughs> in, in all in, in all in all reality, you know when we, when we look at man standing before God as, as a sinner, uh, you know, the real bent, if, if we saw the world correctly, it should be, you know, why is there good in the world? Why does God allow good in the world if, if we're so sinful and unable to be with God because of our sin? So, you know, that's kind of looking at the other side of the coin. But, you know, by nature, I would say, you know, man uh, is a slave to sin uh, until he's set free by Christ set free by Christ, made a new creation. So there's a aspect of that slavery to sin that I think governs the will of man um, to choose and act in the way that he does. Man still acts as he so desires, but those desires are governed by something uh, more than his libertarian free will, I guess. Hmm. That, that's, okay. kind of, that's kind of where I'm getting to. It took me a long I, I, time to formulate that, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's that's all right. The sometimes the uh, most important things take a long time to say. That's why I'm not on Twitter. So I <laughs> I get that. <laughs> but uh... um, I think I get what you're saying. Um, well, this I I don't mean this is a flippant response, but in answer to your question, why is there good in the world? I would say it's because well, God is good with a capital G, and so He gives us good things, even though we don't deserve it, like grace. Um, right. And so I, I what I'm hearing, with. okay, yeah, I, I think yeah. pretty much everybody who's a Christian would agree with that. At least right. I certainly hope they would. <laughs> so um, so what I'm kind of hearing you say is you're you're more adopting a position that our sinful nature, by way of a, something along the lines of a doctrine of original sin, governs what we do. And so in a certain sense, you're saying we don't really have a libertarian free will, at least not in regards to sin. Maybe you'd still say we do in other senses, but not there. I, I, I think, you know, I think we act uh, on our strongest desires, but those desires are for, those are fed by our nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being born in sin, we have a sinful nature that is enslaved to that, and while that comes out in varying degrees in individuals, um, you know, we could look at some individuals and say, well, that person clearly is evil um, by the things that they do. We could look at another person and think that they're, you know, the, the best person in the world, mm-hmm. but there's still, there's still a nature there, unless they've been changed by Christ, and still a nature they're fighting off uh, after coming to Christ, that they've got to continually work through sanctification and, and become more like Christ in the study of his word um, that they have to overcome. But there's still that there that they that they fight um, that tries to control uh, their desires. So that they're not free in the sense that they can just, in a libertarian sense, just choose but those choices are dictated by their nature. Mm-hmm. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, until yeah. until mm-hmm. God uh, regenerates the heart, gives them new life in Christ, um, they're not going to be a new creation and, and not be able to be set free from that sinful nature. Now, obviously, that happens in varying degrees of varying people. You know, we have testimonies where people just, you know, quit drugs, cold turkey, you know, Mm -hmm. everything changed, and then you got others that it was a a process, and, you know, so it's not a one-size-fits-all answer, but um, 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, like try and just kind of form an argument of what you're saying here to make sure I'm following you correctly. Let's say you've got a uh, premise one. Nobody can act outside of or contrary to their nature. Uh, premise two, man's nature is sinful due to original sin or a doctrine like that or, or something along those lines. So conclusion, man cannot do other than sin absent grace. Is that about right? Yeah, I'd say that's probably pretty close. Okay. Um, okay. And, and two, you know, we, we tend to think of sin um, in what we see. And, and can measure uh, in, in what we view in reality. But sin is, is it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely, yes. You know, yes. There, there's a lot more sin that happens in our minds than people are aware of. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Jesus pointed that out, you know, multiple times uh, to individuals. And, and mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's as much emphasis on what happened in the mind as what happened in physical reality. So, you know, when we look at that, too, you know, that, that's a whole other uh, area that gets ignored sometimes, I think, when it comes to the issue of sin. Oh, yeah. I, I would absolutely agree with you there. I had a discussion a while back with somebody who I know had been in church you know, for a while, and he was asking me, uh, well, how do you deal with all these hard questions about the faith, Phil? You seem like a reasonable guy, and I was kind of pleased he thought I was reasonable, and one of his uh, pushbacks was he doesn't see what he didn't see what was so great about grace because he's like, well, I'm not a bad person. I don't go around murdering people and whatnot. And I was like, well, OK, I don't know what your hang ups are in life, where you sin and where you don't. And even if I did, I really doubt it would do either of us any good for me to go listing them. Um, but if you stop and compare yourself to Christ, do you measure up? And uh, he dropped the point when I said it to him that way, because it was pretty clear, if you're honest, you don't. I don't, uh, and nobody I've ever met has. So, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. We live in a time and culture that tends to uh, overlook and de-emphasize uh, the sin and evil nature in all human beings. That's absolutely true. I So... But I don't know if we ever got anywhere with this discussion. I don't feel like oh, I, I think we've made some interesting progress. Yeah. Um, so what I'm hearing you say is your fundamental disagreement with me is kind of that you're saying, well, you don't think due to a doctrine of original sin that we re that if when I sin, I really could do different. Well, I think absent grace, absent grace, absent grace. Yeah, I, you know, and I think, um, yeah. So I don't, I don't mean that um, you're going to be the most evil you can be, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, even in even in good decisions, uh, well, I mean, look at Joseph's brothers; they chose to do something out of evil decision, um, and. Uh, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Even in good decisions, I'm sorry, even in no good problem. decisions sometimes, they're motivated by evil desires. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Where I was going Easy with that. example of that is I would say I think uh, President Trump has made some wise policy decisions, but I'm very doubtful he had good motives to do so. So... <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! So yeah, that's just so such an easy example. So, all right. Well, um, I guess the problem that I again this hits as a fundamental question. The problem I immediately want to ha have with what you're trying to say there is, well, but if I couldn't do different, how can I be guilty of, for it? How can I be punished? Like, because then it seems to me I'm I'm like the the mechanism in the gun that's being shot at somebody where I didn't have any control. But what right. that gets at is a more fundamental question, which is, well, kind of what is the nature or 
essence of sin? Is it something you choose? Is it something that's imposed on or part of your nature? And I could tell you that philosophers and theologians have given multiple answers to that, but as far as a what I think about that, I'm going to have to tell you, I'm not quite sure yet. I haven't quite worked it out <laughs> because I can see the merit in the argument you're giving, but I also can't get quite past the fact that it kind of makes me like the mechanism in the gun. But you're, you're still not, I mean, you still have the ability to act and, and, and choose, but um, it's limited in scope, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I think any reasonable libertarian uh, free will guy would agree with that to some extent. Of course, we're limited in scope. Um, and I'll go, uh, of course, they vary on this, but I'll go far beyond the example of me not being able to fly, where I think you might eat, your limitations are probably limited in scope, even by like who your parents are and where you were raised. And I don't even mean like what opportunities you have in life. I think like the fact that your parents uh, raised you in a certain way, like, um, like my parents were really good, but suppose I had very abusive parents. Well, I think that limits my choices later and could at least limit my choices later in life. It could impose limitations on me. Uh, that might even be, there's that phrase in the Old Testament where God says he revisits the sin of the parents to the, like the third and fourth generation, and that I think could even be what it's alluding to there. So in, in that strain, you know, open up another can of worms here. Uh, <laughs> in a limitation, so like a lot of times, uh, you know, those things around us, you would agree, form uh, who we are. To um, some extent, yes. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. They have they, they influence uh, who we are, uh, your your upbringing, the parents you have, the, the way you were taught, you know, all those things. That, there's multiple things that have factors and influences in your life that mm -hmm. govern um, how you make decisions. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Uh -huh. So in that sense, doesn't that diminish libertarian free will? Uh, in a certain sense, I would say, yeah, I, I, here, I think you need, kind of need to make a distinction between what, for lack of a better term, most people on the internet call libertarian free will, which is, well, you can do whatever, mm -hmm. and what more, uh, reflective and sophisticated philosophers and theologians say about it, where they're going to be like, well, all it means is you did this and you could have done otherwise. It doesn't mean your choices aren't limited by all these factors, and again, they're going to disagree a little bit on how far the factors go. Like, I think I'd go further than some of them. But pretty much ever, anyone who looks at it a little bit more sophisticatedly is going to say, well, no, you don't have the ability to just go do anything. That's a, more of a term called, uh, what's the phrase? That'd be maximal autonomy. And that's where you could just literally do everything. And anybody who's thought about it will realize, well, not even God has maximal autonomy. God can't just go do anything because he can't sin. It's contrary to his nature. And so, of course, we don't have that. I mean, if God doesn't have it, we certainly don't. So that's kind of an impossible concept. Did I lose you? Or? <laughs> no, I uh, I had a thought and I lost it. Um, so you're, you're basically saying that libertarian free will is that they had the possibility to do otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So, like, think back. Uh, well, here's an example. You're talking to me for this podcast. I would say you chose to do that, and you could have decided not to do that, but you mm -hmm. chose to do it. So there, you exercised your free will when you said, decided. Well, yeah, I'm going to come on and talk to Phil for this podcast about evil and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And you could have decided not to, but you didn't. Just because the possibility is there, you still chose the decision decision you chose. Mm -hmm. So what was the deciding – like what governed that decision? Mm. Yeah, that's a uh, – <laughs> that's again a very controversial question. I would say you governed it. That is the thing that is you, Tim, your 
whether you want to call that your will, your soul, your core, there's various names. And pe- a lot of people, a lot of philosophers have tried to, you know, puzzle it out. So they'll do- draw distinctions between like your mind, your will, your intellect and things along those lines. Right. And I, I personally don't like to do that, although there's some very sophisticated and reasonable versions of how people have done that. What I just want to say is, well, you did it. You're an agent. So it, that what governed that was you, the the thing that is you, the central thing or your essence, where wherever it is, however we want to describe it, you chose to do that. And that's what right. governed it. And again, the you is limited by all these various factors. And we could attempt to parse that out down to various details, but there are some limitations there. But still, you decided, well, I want to come on this podcast and talk to Phil about all these issues when you could have decided not to. Mm-hmm. And I'd say that what governs that, what actually originates that is you. It's a agent causation because you're an agent. At least I think you are. I've met you. I'm pretty sure you're not a robot yeah. or something like that. I'm not, I'm not a bot. Uh, exactly. Not a bot. Um, but even then, though, like even that decision was governed by other things than my will Mm -hmm. in a sense so it was it was still you know there there are a lot of factors that went into the decision of that um for me to come on Um, oh yeah of course yeah Mm -hmm. so um and that goes back to i think um you know maybe the question at hand is you know how I don't know. I'm just kind of digging a hole here. Uh, uh, That's all right. Oh, man. Well, maybe maybe this would help. Um, The way I would then try to phrase it is I would say that the causation that's from you, the agent causation, we could say that that's the primary or the essential causation. Uh, And then the other factors that are limitating, like, uh, oh... You wouldn't have made this decision if we hadn't met each other at ApolloCon or if we hadn't connected on Facebook and things along those lines. Those are secondary causations, meaning they're there, but they're not the primary thing. They're not the real oomph, the driving force. Right, but then you get into – so that opens the door into kind of maybe where I'm kind of going towards is what governed those things to happen and those connections to be made in order for me to choose and ultimately those things formulated and happened to bring me to a point of choosing what I chose. So yes, I freely chose to come on the show, but that choice wasn't completely free in the sense that it was influenced and governed by many other factors that happened in my life leading up to this point, Mm -hmm. uh, along with meeting you, uh, along with you starting the podcast shortly after, Mm-hmm. You know all yeah, these yeah. things, and that happen uh, separately from each other, but yet they work together. Um, and um, I think that you know comes full circle back to the whole issue of the libertarian free will thing is that, uh, in a sense, it's limited because there's more going on than what we realize sometimes in in around us and the things that happen in, in the environment around us and individuals we meet, where we go, why we do what we do. Yes, we're choosing to do things, but yet there's an overarching um, sovereignty mm-hmm. in control uh, of, of what's going on. That makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um depending on where you're at, you might consider this a either a little bit of a concession or a explanation. Um, but I, I've often had the thought that uh, the libertarian free will position is a little bit uh, poorly named in that it's more like we have uh, limited free will that is limited by all these other factors, some of which we have control over, many of which we do not. Uh, I don't I don't have control over the fact that I was born a... Uh, male human being in America, you know, there's nothing I could have done about that. I, I had no control over that. And that limits my free will options. I don't have the option of 
deciding I wanted to be born in China or something like that. I'm limited in that sense. Um, so yeah, I would I would agree with uh, most of that in that we are limited and many of those things are beyond our control. Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> I think we're saying the same thing. Uh, it's uh, like I said when we began the conversation, I was expecting one thing and saw, found something else. Uh. <laughs> I, I have found that uh, very often some of the more uh, reasonable philosophical and theological positions people take, they're not as far apart as they tend to think they are. And the people who are very, very far apart are the ones who, uh, well, I, I don't want to speak to... I shouldn't speak disparagingly of everybody, but the people who haven't really stopped and considered all the complexities involved, and usually the people who have will say, well, I take this position, but you take this position, but we're really not terribly far apart. We just kind of, you emphasize this aspect and I emphasize this other aspect a little bit more or something like that. Right. So would you say that God is ultimately in control of everything, even our, uh, everything that happens. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and actually, that's something I've considered doing a whole uh, list of shows on in the future, with, um, the problem of divine foreknowledge. And part of the reason I want to do that is because that's one of the more common simplistic objections you see people raising to Christianity. And what I want to say is, well, no, look, there's a wealth of options responding to this. You can be a Calvinist. You can be a Molinist. You can take the uh, Catholic uh, Thomistic or Aquinas response. You can just believe in some simple divine foreknowledge. You can reject the problem altogether. It's not really a problem, a knockdown, drag out problem because any one of these proposed solutions deals with the problem. Even, you know, even if you're a Molinist who thinks that Calvinist is Calvinism is wrong, you kind of have to admit, well, yeah, if Calvinism is right, then there is no problem of divine foreknowledge. And I think a a reasonable Calvinist would have to say the same thing to the Molinist. Don't open that can, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, my th my thought was I'd do like an introduction and then have a Molinist on, a Calvinist on, a Thomist on, and you know oh, just yeah. have them all run through their various solutions and just to kind of show, hey, you know this really isn't a problem that should be keeping you from being a Christian. Look at this wealth of options you have to choose from. Um. Like I said, I don't know that we're that far off in what we're saying. So... Well, no, yeah, I've I've often had the thought that a more reasonable, uh, compatibilistic or deterministic view is really not that far from a more reasonable, limited, libertarian free will. It's more kind of what they're emphasizing, which is I want to emphasize more the agent causation and say, yeah, I've got all these limited things, things that limit me as far as what I can do, but I'm making the choice. And it seems a little more like where you're coming from the other perspective where you're say, you want to more emphasize, well, you've got all these things that limit you. Maybe you make a choice, but you've got all these things that limit you. Right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, ultimately too, with the problem of evil. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. That's all right. Do you have any uh, uh, like concluding thoughts or remarks you'd like to leave us with, or to wrap, kind of help wrap up, or? Uh, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just hoping I don't sound like a total idiot. I don't um, think. You did. No, no. I I think you kind of represented that 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 position pretty uh, pretty well. I think you said what most people who come from your, your perspective would. Yeah. But uh, no, I think, you know, I, I think we're on the same page on a lot of things. You know, where we differ is our soteriology, where that plays in, and man's ability to um, to act freely and, and what that entails and what that looks like and, mm -hmm. uh, and why evil exists. And, and, uh, I think, you know, when we deal with the problem of evil, you know, you got to point people to the gospel. And, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and go to the solution to the problem of evil. And, you know, that's that's the thing I would end with is, you know, it's important that when we get into these discussions that it's easy to get kind of tied up in all the 
the details and mm -hmm. and the arguments of you know how things work and 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 what arguments better than the other. But what we really need to focus on a lot of time is just getting to the gospel and, and saying, yeah, well, yeah, there is a problem with evil in the world, and you know this this problem exists because of our sin and our sinful nature, and you know the only way to solution to fix this problem of evil was Christ, and He had to come and He had to die on the cross. So that if we put our faith and trust in him for what he did for us on the cross, you know, we can be saved, we can have salvation, we can be made a new creation and overcome that evil in our life through the power of Christ and uh, then take that to the world around us with the gospel and, and lead others to him. So you know, I think ultimately, ultimately that should be our goal in, in mm -hmm. addressing the problem of evil is, is, is leading people to the solution. Um, and uh, and uh, like I said, trying not to get caught up in all the all the details like we discussed uh in, in the episode uh it's fun to to kind of hash out uh these differences uh and different opinions with each other but at the same time you know we can't lose sight of of the real reason uh why it matters um and, and, and the purpose behind it and ultimately you know the greater purpose of leading others to christ you know even mm -hmm. even the worst evil in the world that brings up this the question of the problem of evil is an opportunity to lead somebody to Christ. So, um, you know, it's that in itself can be the purpose that you point to. Of, well, it brought you to this point to ask these serious questions and actually seek out God for an answer. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we've, we've got to point people to the gospel. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we get caught up in, in our differences and we forget that. And, uh, but I've enjoyed the podcast, and uh, thank you. Yeah, for having uh, me. That, I think that was a great summary. I I really like that, and I appreciate you coming on. I I think also think it's really great to hash these things out like this. And one of the reasons I do is because I think then when uh, people do get into suffering, when if they have uh, resources like this, if they've looked at these problems, that's going to turn around and help them. I can just think of times in my own life where. I was going through some suffering and having some problems and God would say to me, well, hey, when this when this happened to you before, when you were suffering this way, did I know what I was doing? Did I take care of you? And I'd go, well, yeah. And then God would say, well, then I've got this. You need to quit your whining. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this can really help people. But So hopefully they've got these resources in mind even before they get to that horrible tragedy in their life and maybe they can turn to it. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, you have a good evening and hopefully we'll get to talk to you again sometime. Sounds good. Okay. So now write in, tell me what you think. Do you agree with uh, Tim a bit more, me a bit more, why or why not? And as always, I'm certainly open for more suggestions on other topics we could cover. And if you have any pushback, just just uh, write into the show and let me know. And I'll be back again next week. Thanks again for listening. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day. <laughs>